Greetings and welcome to LSI Industries Fiscal Fourth Quarter 2023 Results Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. It is now my pleasure to introduce Jim Galise, Chief Financial Officer. Thank you. You may begin. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining. We issued a press release before the market opened this morning detailing our fiscal 23 fourth quarter and full year results. In conjunction with this release, we also posted a conference call presentation in the investor relations portion of our corporate website at www.lsicorp.com. Information contained in this presentation will be referenced throughout today's conference call. Included are certain non-GAAP measures for improved transparency of our operating results. A complete reconciliation of GAAP and non-GAAP results is contained in our press release and 10K. Please note that management's commentary and responses to questions on today's conference call may include forward-looking statements about our business outlook. Such statements involve risks and opportunities, and actual results could differ materially. I refer you to our safe harbor statement, which appears in this morning's press release, as well as our most recent 10-K and 10-Q. Today's call will begin with remarks summarizing our fiscal fourth quarter and full year results. At the conclusion of these prepared remarks, we will open the line for questions. With that, I'll turn the call over to LSI President, and Chief Executive Officer, Jim Clark. Thank you, Jim. Good morning, all, and thank you for joining us today. As you've likely seen by now, we had a solid fourth quarter and a very strong close for the year. This year's performance, along with the strong performance over the last few years, is thanks to the work and effort of 1,600 or so team members at LSI. It's also thanks to the efforts and confidence of our agents, our partners, and the vast network and number of customers we serve. Our customers, agents, and partners trust LSI to be their partner of choice to deliver high-quality solutions that help their business grow. I could not be prouder of the contributions of so many in helping us achieve a real milestone in the history and journey of LSI. Just about four years ago, we developed and published a goal of being a $500 million company with double-digit EBITDA performance in 2025. I'm happy to say that we have wholly met that goal as we finish the year just shy of 500 million and just over $52 million of EBITDA. And we did that a full two years earlier than our plan. We finished this year in a very strong financial position as we generated over $46 million of free cash flow for the year and reduced our net debt to about $35 million. It's quite an accomplishment for a company that was struggling to hit $300 million in sales and $15 million of EBITDA just four years ago. As many of you know, we published an updated plan back in March, which we call our Fast Forward Plan. It outlines our roadmap to get to $800 million in sales and nearly $100 million in EBITDA performance in 2028. The plan is an ambitious as our original plan to hit $500 million in sales, but this time we'll be doing it with the advantage of a seasoned team of folks on our management team, right through our sales team, manufacturing floor, and operations team. Much like our original plan, it calls for a balance of growth through organic activities and M&A. It continues to focus on our strategic initiative of zeroing in on high potential vertical markets such as grocery, sea store, warehousing and manufacturing, automotive and sports courts, among others. And it allows us to deliver a variety of goods and services to those markets. Those goods and services are differentiated. They are designed and developed to serve those vertical markets in a way that commodity and catalog offerings cannot. And they provide value to our customers that help them run their businesses. Over the past five years, we have regularly been introducing more than 20 new products each and every year. Last year, our spotlight product was the LSI ReadyMount. 
The ready mount allows our customers and our installers the opportunity to install our award-winning canopy lighting solutions more efficiently and with less time and cost to them. In addition, it allows for vastly simplified installation, service, and upgrade process, and it creates a long-term relationship with our customers in which everyone benefits. This year in 2024, we will continue that pace of development and innovation with the introduction of more than 20 new products again, and with our flagship solution being a next generation, environmentally friendly refrigerated display solution that uses no ozone depleting chemicals. This product will move away from man-made refrigerants into an organic gas refrigerant that has a zero ozone depleting footprint and virtually no global warming potential. We are in the process now of adding an additional manufacturing facility in Maine that will house this R290 solution with the goal of taking orders in Q2 and delivering first generation products in Q3 of 2024. Our digital menu board division continues to gain interest in orders from an ever expanding base of customers. Three years back, we were fortunate to be awarded a $100 million project to install outdoor digital menu boards across the country for one of the world's largest quick serve burger chains. We have wholly completed that project with a very satisfied customer, and we've made a significant name for ourselves as a quality supplier and partner that can manage not only the design and manufacturing of this solution, but also the project management, installation, and post-sales support. With that, we have a small but growing revenue, uh, recurring revenue associated with this ongoing remote content management and services, and we continue to differentiate ourselves as a company as a full solutions provider. With an oversized award like this project, there has to be a lot of work done to fill the gap once things are complete. And I'm happy to say our sales and design team have done an outstanding job of doing just that by infilling ongoing activities of that $100 million order with a variety of customers from burgers to chicken, Chinese food to tacos. We're very excited to continue to expand this solution. And we think in the long run, digital displays will find a place in other areas of our vertical marketing strategy. Our lighting division continues to innovate and expand its product and services offering. LSI has always been known for its industry leading outdoor lighting and advanced control solutions, but it's also always had a very robust indoor product lighting offering. Our ability to deliver these solutions to the vertical markets we serve has continued to pay dividends for LSI, our customers and our investors. We believe LSI has a lot of runway left. We have a team of folks that are ready to continue our growth in lighting, digital and print displays, refrigerated solutions, and our expanding base of project management and service solutions. We have a well thought out strategy and a plan to grow that is adaptable to changing market conditions and competitive forces. We feel confident in our ability to manage and seek out continued productivity and cost opportunities while managing price, margin, and cash flow. With that, I'll turn the call over to Jim Galise, who will provide additional details on our fourth quarter and full year performance. Thank you, Jim. A solid fourth quarter capped a successful year for LSI. In summary, fourth quarter operating income increased 43% year over year on sales of 124 million. The business generated 14 million of adjusted EBITDA in Q4, 33% above last year, and continued to realize margin expansion with adjusted EBITDA margin of 11.4%, 310 basis points above last year. Fourth quarter reported earnings per share were 28 cents with adjusted EPS at 30 cents. This compares to 18 cents and 21 cents respectively for the prior year quarter. Improved profitability combined with a lower fourth quarter effective tax rate drove the increase. The lower tax rate contributed 4 cents to reported EPS and 3 cents to adjusted EPS. For the full fiscal year, sales increased to 497 million 
representing 9% year-over-year growth. Adjusted net income increased 61% to $29 million. Adjusted earnings per share increased 55% to $0.99 cents per share. This represents the company's highest full-year EPS in over 20 years. Full-year adjusted EBITDA increased to $52 million, with the adjusted EBITDA margin rate expanding 270 basis points to 10.4%, and all quarters showing considerable improvement over prior year. Our significantly improved earnings and working capital efficiency generated full-year free cash flow of $46 million. Cash generation was positive throughout the year, culminating with fourth-quarter cash flow of approximately $16 million. Strong cash flow was applied to reduce the level of outstanding debt. We reduced debt by over 50% in the last 12 months to $35 million, lowering our ratio of net debt to trailing 12-month adjusted EBITDA to 0.7 times. Lower debt was a capital allocation priority in fiscal 23 and provides the balance sheet flexibility to pursue both organic and inorganic growth initiatives as outlined in our updated five-year strategic plan. A regular cash dividend of five cents per share was declared payable September 5th for shareholders of record on August 28th. Now, a few comments on segment performance. Lighting growth continued in Q4, with sales increasing 5%, representing the ninth consecutive quarter of growth compared to the prior year period. Growth reflects ongoing healthy activity in our key vertical markets, particularly parking applications, warehousing, and automotive. For fiscal year 23, lighting sales increased 17%, with double-digit growth achieved in both indoor and outdoor applications. Our assessment is that we are taking share and outperforming the market, a combination of our expanding position in key markets and the overall vitality of these priority verticals. The lighting gross margin rate improved to 33% in the fourth quarter, and the full-year margin rate improved to 32%, 190 basis points above last year. We enter fiscal 24 with a project quotation level steady at a high level, and Q4 bookings were favorable, with a book-to-bill ratio above one. We are seeing some slowing in large projects, but small and medium project activity remains healthy. We continue to experience lengthening quote-to-order conversion periods, but these are holding steady. These are committed projects, but because of financing and budgetary purposes, Final specs and product requirements are constantly being modified, delaying order release. Pricing remains steady, and material input costs vary by commodity, but overall input costs remain aligned with pricing. As expected, fourth quarter display solutions sales declined versus the prior year, as the prior year quarter was a peak period for our large digital menu board order. Full-year display solution sales increased 1%, but sales increased 13% when excluding the digital menu board order, reflecting the ongoing strength and investment in the grocery, refueling C-store, and QSR market verticals. Full-year display operating income increased 43% and realized significant margin rate expansion, with the gross margin rate improving 470 basis points and operating income improving to 11.6% of sales. The mix of higher value applications, along with improved program pricing, drove the rate expansion. We enter fiscal 24 with very active customer inquiry levels for branding and image initiatives, particularly in the refueling C-store and grocery space. In addition, we are experiencing very high interest in our new refrigerated display case product, scheduled for launch in Q3 of fiscal 24. We will begin taking orders late in fiscal Q2 for shipment beginning in fiscal Q3. In summary, it was a solid quarter and fiscal year for LSI. We enter fiscal 24 well positioned to build on this success. The market is steady at a healthy level 
and will support our commercial and efforts with continued strong operational execution and effective margin management. I will now return the call back to the moderator. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we will be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask your question, you may press star one on your telephone keypad. The confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star two if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star key. Our first question comes from the line of Aaron Spachella with Craig Hallam. Please proceed with your question. Yeah, good morning, Jim and Jim. Thanks for taking the questions. Um, you know, first for me, you know, I saw in the deck you kind of talked about the second half of, of FY24 being stronger than the first half. Can you just talk about some of the factors that go into that? And then just more broadly on the markets that you're in seem to be a little more insulated from from the macro and, you know, have had good CapEx trends. Can you just talk a little bit about, you know, paybacks or return on investment or just other factors that, that customers are looking at uh, when evaluating lighting and display versus other projects? Uh, good morning, Aaron. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Thanks for getting on the call. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, we're not shielded from anything any more or less than anybody else. But as we've talked before, kind of in this forum and others, uh, you know, when we selected our strategy is really based around vertical markets. And we want to be, uh, you know, more to fewer as opposed to something to everyone. And within those vertical markets we picked, we look for how we can add value to the, our customers' businesses and help them improve their overall uh, function as a business. And then uh, also, you know, how they would respond to any kind of, reset, you know, kind of uh, external macro pressures and things like that. So the markets that we've picked are generally aligned with that. Uh, they're not immune, uh, but they're more resistant, if you will. So, um, you know, as you look at across our vertical markets like grocery or, or C-Store or, um, you know, interestingly enough, uh, automotive has just, been on fire. Um, we just thought that these are markets that uh, will kind of move through the cycles of this in a in a longer term, and but the customers will still invest and keep to their plans, uh, and that's proven out uh, to be pretty solid strategy over the last you know five years or so. Uh, in terms of strength in the second half, and you know uh, for us, I just mentioned it a few minutes ago. You know we're going to be introducing some newer products. Uh, you know, probably at the top of mind this year is the introduction of our R290 refrigerated solution. You know, it's a zero ozone, zero, um, you know, global warming contributor. And it, it's, um, you know, it's a product we think is going to have a lot of demand and we have a lot of opportunity with it. So we see that as, you know, as being a real uh, growth driver in the second half. And then lastly, I would say to that, you're aware of the seasonality we have you know, where these numbers right now reflect a Q4 participation, we'll have the Q1 participation, but, you know, the winter months are, from a seasonality perspective, are usually a little bit lighter on us. It's got nothing to do with um, demand or interest or lost deals or anything. It's just the reality of doing exterior installations and such, uh, you know, during winter months. And Aaron, Jim Galise here. The only thing I would add to that, uh, uh, Jim covered it very thoroughly, is, uh, you know, we mentioned about the lengthening quote to, to order conversion, uh, you know, rate. You know, that started sometime in, you know, in Q3 and is, is continuing. You know, so that, that'll affect us from out the door more in the first half. That'll be the, the, the norm and stabilized and hopefully condensed a little bit, you know, by the second half, of, you know, the second half of the year. So that'll be be more in a normal operating um, environment. Right, right. That makes sense. And then um, just second on margins, you know, great, great job, obviously, to, to date. Um, and you've talked about, you know, some of the runway that's left there. Can you just provide a little bit more detail on, you know, some of the key levers um, and, and just how margins might, um, you know, progress as, as we think about FY24? Well, uh, you, you know that we're pretty good about uh, planning and you know I think our fast forward plan up on the web is a good indication of how we like to set our goals and objectives. We have a number of things we feel we can still do operationally 
from a procurement standpoint, from a manufacturing standpoint. But a lot of those things are gated by the ongoing kind of variations. Uh, you know, we uh, input commodity pricing, some things are moving down, some things are moving up. Labor is still a bit unsteady. I mean, we've been doing very good with it and, and we feel very good, but it's still just a bit unsteady. And it's not really within our company as much as externally. And so some of the programs that we want to initiate, implement, and continue to refine and implement are it's the timing's just not right because, you know, you're, you're trying to do things while it's raining outside. So it's just better to, you know, for some of those things to wait uh, when things become more stable, but we have the plans to implement that. And, and when I say that we have more runway, we have the plans to do those things. And I think you can see from our margin performance and stuff, we're incrementally implementing those. But if the environment was a little bit more stable, and again, I'm not – just talking about internal, I'm talking about external partners and things like that, installation teams, permitting issues, things like that. We think there's another couple of turns of the wheel we can uh, implement that just allow us to become more efficient and they'll be reflected in margin. Aaron, one of the things we're you know very encouraged about our margin expansion has been it's been very balanced, not driven by one particular uh, element. You know, so volume certainly over the last year has been a been a contributor. You know, higher quality you know applications, so higher quality mix uh, certainly playing into that. Our ability to you know, to really, and we spend a lot of time on this, uh, getting pricing right. You know, by by program representing you know the value of the solutions we're providing and the customer recognizing that. You know, so we spend a lot of time on on pricing. And then, uh, you know, we, we always keep a sharp eye on, on costs, our material input costs, our design savings, you know, et cetera. So all those serve to uh, contributing to the, you know, the margin expansion we've driven now over the last couple of years. Right, right. Thanks for that. And then just maybe last, um, you know, really nice free cash flow generation and, and continuing to pay down the debt um, over the last year and a half. You know, can you just maybe uh, give an update on on kind of capital allocation priorities? Saw the mention of, of organic and, and inorganic, um, but just maybe some more color there. Yeah, I don't think you're going to see any material changes in, you know, our capital uh, models that we've used in the past. Uh, you know, I think you have to uh, give some way for inflation and, you know, the general uh you know, from a total dollar standpoint, just the inflated cost of things that are going to be with us, you know, for some time. Uh, but beyond that, there, you know, we don't see any radical changes to our past performance. Yeah, and our priority items, you know, we see in the short intermediate term remaining the same, correct? Okay, and then anything, you know, uh, I mean, on, uh, anything new on, on the M&A outlook as we kind of, you know, think about that opportunity with, with kind of the balance sheet, you know, much improved? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's always a, a tricky subject to talk about. You know, I'll, I'll just, you know, I'll say what I've said in the past. We always have our oars in the water looking for opportunities. Um, we think that uh, we think the environment's a bit better right now. I mean, I know there's a, a lot of thoughts on this, but – we think the environment's a bit better right now. Uh, you know, I think there, there's a lot of owners faced with, uh, you know, or smaller businesses are faced with ongoing struggles or stabilization of their business and, and how much they want to continue to put in. Um, you know, I think that the, the change in uh, cost of capital and such has, you know, slowed down some of these uh, stratospheric multiples. And I, I like the tone of the conversations a lot better today. Uh, than I did a year ago, and uh, and our activity level is uh, is strong. Uh, and but as you know, uh, you know you've been following us for a while. Um, you know we're very disciplined. We're disciplined buyers, and the value's got to be there. Uh, you know not just from a financial perspective, but how it fits into our strategy, and then how it fits into our culture. Right, right, and appreciate that. Um, that's. That's it for me. Thanks for taking the questions. I'll turn it over. Okay. Thanks, sir. Our next question comes from the line of George Giannarikis with Canaccord Genuity. Please proceed with your question. Hi. Uh, good morning, uh, and thanks for taking my question, and thanks for uh, coming to our conference last week. <clears throat> 
Yeah, good morning, George, and thank you. It was great to see you, and uh, in, in what it was a great conference too. Uh, we certainly had a full dance card through the whole thing, and I, uh, you know, I appreciate the invite. That's great to hear. Um, so maybe to start, uh, just a couple questions on the uh, macroeconomic environment. You mentioned that these are you'd seen some. You expressed some consternation last quarter uh, about some just small signs you were seeing in the marketplace that maybe things weren't exactly going uh, swimmingly. And what has changed about the character of, of the issue that you've seen that you expressed uh, some issues about last quarter and, and also addressed this quarter as well? Are there, you expressed some issues with close rates, but is there a different, uh, the, is the character of the customer that you're seeing issues with changing or is it sort of the same that you saw last quarter? Yeah, it, 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 first of all, it's, uh, I, I'll just sum it up in one word, which is timing. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not interest. It's not quote activity. It's not project activity. All of those things remain on, you know, on the same pace that we've had uh, you know, for the uh, you know, last couple of years, if you will. Uh, and, and in general, by the way, those, that activity rate has increased kind of quarter over quarter. What we're seeing is a lengthening in the, uh, the, the process, if you will, the initial request for a quote, the sit down and discussion, and then, if you will, the, the, the final decision, that lengthening between the, the final quote and agreement on the project and the actual execution of the project has been lengthening. Uh, it's stable right now, but at an extended kind of arm, if you will, and uh, we just noted, I, I just brought it up in the sense that from a timing perspective, things that we saw that might have closed in, you know, that we were planning on closing, uh, you know, June 20th are now closing, you know, July 18th. Things that we thought traditionally were going to close on, you know, or through our systems indicated a close on May 12th, you know, didn't happen until June 26th. Uh, we're not losing any projects. Uh, we're just seeing that once we get to that point where we're like, okay, we're ready to move forward, we've noticed just in some of our customer base that time between, okay, we're done, let me get you the purchase order has just lengthened a bit. And I think there's lots of factors for it. I think there's lots of reasons for it. Most of them are external. Um, you know, they could be in new construction. There, there are things like you know, final funding releases and things like that. As you know, all the banks have tightened up. And when you're in a project like that, uh, it's just taking a couple more checks and signatures, uh, you know, for developers or such to get, you know, to keep the timing going. When we're talking about remodels and things like that, we're, you know, we're looking at uh, labor issues, either external uh, subcontractors or even in some cases, internally just the number of people to get all the, the paperwork and the processes done so uh, you know I, I just think it's fair we've always been very transparent uh and we just wanted to kind of mention it i do not want to overplay it you know george the uh, you know the secular trends of some of our key verticals remain you know very sound uh if you look at refueling c store grocery you know qsr the level of inquiry we continue to receive with respect to branding, refresh, strengthening image remains extremely you know, healthy. And that's driven by two things. We continue to look for more you know, energy efficient solutions with consideration of environmental factors. That's where our R290 plays into, you know, but also the customer experience, you know, as things are uh, their competitive environment and so forth. So these are, are, are sectors that have been performing very well. Uh, they've done very well financially, and so they continue to invest. So we see some of these secular trends in some in our key verticals remaining uh, remaining pretty healthy. As Jim's point, right. and it just comes down to timing. Right. So so no cancellations, just you know timing issues, so to speak. Yep. And and, and like okay. we said, that that kind of popped up in the spring and. Um, and it, and it hasn't lengthened anymore, but it's at an extended level right now. Because we track this stuff, right. right? We we look, and, you know, it's not perfect science or anything, but we have an expectation from initial inquiry to project development to final spec 
to order, you know, to actual order, and then obviously through manufacturing and delivery. And we've just seen, and, and you know, I, to be honest too, I, I want to be candid here. It's not just an extension; it's kind of a little bit of an accordion. Um, it's extended. We're in an extended phase, and then you know things can compress on us. So, right. Um, and, and how's the permitting environment? You had expressed some issues with that. <clears throat> I think maybe last quarter, the quarter before that. You know, are you getting permits on time? Yeah, I think that that is wholly stabilized. You know, is still at a very extended uh, permitting time in Mexico. Uh, but you know, that's just that just may be the new norm for you know years or months. You know, but it's just now it's just the new norm down there. But domestically. The states in Canada that has stabilized, um, and you know it, it's yeah, it's less of an issue right now. Um, uh, you gave some kind of qualitative guidance around uh, fiscal twenty four that you discussed uh, with the previous question. I'm curious as to whether you can help us bridge twenty three to twenty eight. We should. Do you think twenty four will be a growth year? I think we're, you know, we're one month into the year right now, so it's, uh, I don't know, you know, it's, we have some limited visibility, but it'd be pre premature for me to kind of, uh, you know, guess on 24 or forecast on 24. Um, I will say that I expect that, uh, you know, I can tell you in lighting, I think that, uh, you know, the, the signs remain positive within that limited, you know, window that we have, let's say, you know, a two month window or, or such. I think that um, a more uh, a timing related in the display side, uh, and that has to do with uh, construction schedules and that lengthening uh, timing we talked about from quote to actual order. So I don't see any um, concern about our ability to continue to grow. I do see that, you know, timing related issues could be off, you know, 30, 60 days. And what I worry about in the public market side is that, you know, something that pushes one quarter that will pick up in the next quarter is overreacted at any given time. So that's, you know, that's one of the reasons why we kind of mention it. Uh, but I don't see anything, I don't see anything that's going to keep us, take us too far off track of where we're going. Yeah, we, we're, we feel you. confident we'll continue to outperform the market. All right, so to Jim's point, whatever the market may end up being. And we also uh, feel feel solid about maintaining the quality of our earnings uh, as well. That's a great segue to my, to my last question. You know, with regard to uh, the M&A environment, how much does earnings accretion matter to you when you look at targets? Well, I will tell you that, I mean, I think we have a demonstrated management team with the ability to kind of um, work with something that w is dilutive and create value. Um, but, you know, we could, would also certainly like to, you know, kind of focus on things that are accretive uh, right from the beginning. Uh, I think that it would be anything that we would do that, what we, that we would consider that, um, that might be initially dilutive, you can be assured we have a plan that will make it accretive a, a at some point and, and not to and not take too long. Uh, if we did something accretive, we want to make sure we're not paying too much of a premium that washes away that accretion. So, uh, what I would tell you is, we're disciplined investors. Uh, we're choosy, um, and I just mentioned it with Aaron's question. You know, we don't look just at the financial metrics. Uh, we look at how it fits into our strategy. There's no sense having orphans to our strategy. Uh, and then lastly, or maybe not lastly, uh, but just as importantly, we look at culture. Uh, we don't want to kind of take a square peg, no matter what its performance is, and try to force it into our, you know, our round hole, if you will. So, um, you know, all of those factors, uh, you know, help make our decisions, but I would just underline with saying we're disciplined and, uh, but I am encouraged by the environment right now. I think there's, there's more in front of us, maybe based on our results, maybe based on the general market, or maybe based on, you know, a combination of all of those things. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. 
George, thank you for thank you for the questions. Our next question comes from the line of Samir Joshi with HC Wainwright. Please proceed with your question. Hey guys, uh, good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, just a couple on uh, uh, the orders. Uh, the EV battery manufacturing facility order. Uh, have you disclosed the scope uh, in dollar terms of that uh, uh, opportunity uh, going forward? We haven't. Uh, you know what I would like to say is it's you know it's a single digit. It doesn't represent any uh, you know double digit improvement in our quarter or anything. Um, we're excited about it, and we wanted to share that news. Uh, but those, these type of projects, uh, we roll in and roll out of on a constant basis. You know, I think that, uh, you know, I know that there was, there's been a number of questions over the, you know, last year or so, like projects like our large digital menu board order. You know, it's a hundred million dollar project that hits you all at once. Well, you know, while we were executing against you know, the delivery of that project, we were also executing around backfilling that, uh, you know, and so when you have a big spike like that, like a big order like that, our attention outside of delivering on that immediately turns to, okay, how do we maintain this elevated level? The, the EV uh, project, uh, that EV project doesn't rise to that same level, uh, but it was, you know, it was a project we wanted to make note of uh, not only because of the composition of the project, uh, but because it's within what we consider our Ohio region. You know, we like this whole concept of Ohio for Ohio, buying locally. Uh, but that buying locally, by the way, also extends to Texas and extends to, you know, Utah and the West Coast. Wherever we have a facility, we're trying to make sure we're visible in the community and we want to participate in a way that allows our employees to see their work in a local facility, but also for those customers to see the pride of the people that are in that area. So, uh, you know, that's why we highlighted it. We were excited about it. It's a sizable project. And to be completely frank, we're, you know, working on phase two of that right now. So maybe there be something else we have, but it's, it doesn't rise to the level where it um, created any big anomaly in the quarter or anything. It's just another one of those larger projects we get. Understood. Thanks for that. Uh, and on the display side, uh, uh, th there is a capacity expansion um, um, that is being planned uh, or already underway. Uh, is there any significant capex involved in that, or is it just uh, a few couple million dollars? Yeah, it, it's a couple million dollars, and it's kind of within our plan, um, you know, plus or minus a million or so. It, nothing, again, I think the first one of the first questions we got was around our capital plan, and uh, it, it remains consistent with our prior years, uh, you know, adjusted for inflationary environment, you know, inflationary costs and things like that. But um, yeah, it's already included, and it's uh, not significant. Uh, we we have been in in our prior years, we've been staging up for this, so there has been incremental investments we've made that we're now just consolidating into one facility, new facility. Understood. Uh, and then just, uh, uh, you mentioned a few things uh, in terms of uh, uh, delay, uh, lead time uh, delays. Uh, how does that impact uh, your OPEX uh, and working capital uh, requirements? Uh, another way to ask the question is, uh, do you see any impact on uh, uh, operating profits uh, because of these delays? No. Um, and they're, they don't rise to the level where they, you know, uh, disrupt, uh, you know, a quarter significantly. But, you know, there could be, you know, mid-single-digit uh, adjustments on a quarter-by-quarter -quarter basis. But if, I think if you took any two quarters together, uh, they would normalize. Okay, and and so we should expect uh, operating leverage uh, uh, year over year. Uh, in, in, in in other words, operating expense as a percent of revenue uh, will be uh, should be expected to be lower. In the yeah, well, that is one of the levers we pull, right? Is yeah. that um, and so yeah, I mean, I think there's still a lot of there's still a lot of those efficiencies, and there's still a lot of the timing things that we can do. Uh, you know, to create that opportunity. And 
And that's just our ongoing job to execute against them. And I think, you know, this year, if you look at 2024 on a whole, you can see that kind of incremental steps up. You know, um, sometimes we're taking two steps forward and a half step back, you know, and sometimes we're taking, you know, a half step forward. So, uh, but if you look at it on an aggregated basis, you can see that continual improvement. You know, Samir, I'll just add that, you know, there are some variable costs in operating expense, so they do flex. So, you know, if, 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 if there is a bit of softness somewhere, things like, you know, agency commissions, uh, you know, go down because you don't, you don't pay it. So there is, we'll be able to, uh, we'll be able to manage, you know, our OPEX, uh, you know, in line with our operating margin expectations. Understood. And then uh, the distribution of, uh, or, or rather contribution from the lighting versus display, I think this quarter uh, you uh, had around 57.7% of revenues uh, from lighting. Uh, is that trend, uh, uh, is that proportion expected uh, in the next few quarters? Uh, and if so, does it imply a better gross margin uh, going forward? No, I, I think that, um, you know, and I, I'm not making any blanket statements here, but in general, uh, lighting has more of a sensitivity to uh, the seasonality we talked about than Display Solutions does. Um, I think that you'll always see it kind of hovering in this, uh, you know, 50-50, uh, 40-60 range. It's not going to go outside of those uh, those markers. If you think about it in terms of a football field, we're going to play between the 40s all the time, you know, lighting and display solutions. Uh, and, and gross margin implications? In, uh, in, in what regards, you mean? The rate? Uh, and because I think your lighting segment uh, gross margins are 33% plus and uh, display is are, are lower. Uh, so yeah, much, much different business profile. The, you know, if you, I think that in order to get an apples to apples comparison, you look at the top line revenue and you look at the bottom yeah, line. The the stuff that, yeah, the operating margin. The stuff that happens in the middle is really a reflection of the, two, the differences between the two business. One being more capital intensive than the other. Um, One has a higher gross margin rate than the other, but the, the other may have a lower opex, Samir, as you know. Right. right. Yeah. So yeah. they wash out. Yeah. As you know, at the bottom operating margin, they're they're pretty close. Yeah, yeah, and we have discussed this in the past. Thanks for that. Yeah, um, I, I, you know, to just to just to further that one other, just one other comment. I don't think you're ever going to see the gross margins kind of Never. equal up. It's not, it's just not. Different they're size. fundamentally different businesses, and they're just a different structure. So I think it's really important to look at that, you know, top line and up income. You know, that that's your that's your true measure. Understood. And then just last one, uh, how big is this uh, refrigerated display uh, for the R290? Uh, uh, the, how big is that opportunity uh, that you're looking at right now? Well, I mean, I, I think it still fits within the whole refrigerated, portable refrigerated display market. It's just that we think that, you know, it is, um, it, it's a, a leading edge, if you will, technology, and you know it could create a, a lot of opportunity for us to take additional share. The market's bigger than than we, you know, by a magnitude bigger than we serve. And the mobile refrigerated display market continues to grow. To grow, right? So, you know, our thing is always about um, we have to earn every project we take, and once we uh, get that, um, you know, we get a tremendous amount of customer loyalty and we, we do, uh, you know, we are, hold it in very high regard to make sure we hold on to that. The stickiness we have with our customers is demonstrated, you know, through our continued performance and our customer list. But we have to go out and the market is much bigger than us right now and we need to go out and fight for every new opportunity there is. And once we get those opportunities, we do do a pretty good job of holding on to them. But, I, I, you know, nobody's going to be the the opportunity is not going to be beating down our door. We still need to go out and earn every every dollar. Great. Uh, thanks for that color and thanks for taking my questions. Uh, good luck. All right. Thank you, Samir. Thanks. Our next question comes from the line of Rick Fion with Creative Capital Partners. Please proceed with your question. 
Uh, good morning, Jim and Jim, and congrats on another fantastic quarter. Uh, nice, nice job backfilling on the menu board business. Um, just a, you know, a couple questions regarding M and A have already come up, and you know, my only question is a little more specific about the acquisition philosophy, Jim. Uh, mm -hmm mostly regarding your sort of buy versus build considerations, uh, you know, maybe specific to, you know, some product extensions like security or, um, you know, as you get into the new refrigerants right now, I mean, this is the success you had with ready mount that, you know, the opportunity that R290 seems to represent it's, um, it's just exciting what you're doing internally and, and good acquisitions are hard to find. So it'd be, interesting to hear what you're seeing on the M&A side versus, you know, how much growth you think you, you guys will accomplish organically. Uh, well, good morning, Rick, and thanks for joining the call, and thanks for the comments. Um, you know, uh, first of all, if, if you look at the fast-forward plan and you look at our prior plan, you know, our 2025 plan, uh, you know, both of those have a component of organic growth and M&A. And, you know, between 2019 and 2020, in the end of this 2023, you know, we led with organic growth, and M&A was a piece of that. Uh, in our 2028 fast-forward plan, we still have organic growth as the majority contributor with M&A as a minority contributor. They're close, but, you know, for sake of discussion and, and alignment in the business, we want to, you know, the, the real discipline and the real execution comes around organic growth, uh, and we want to make sure that we're balanced in that. In terms of the make versus buy and that type of thing, it varies by market, right? In the security, we, we definitely want to be in the security business. I don't see us making security equipment. There's plenty of, um, you know, very uh, well-organized, well-run equipment manufacturers in the security side. I'm not, we're not interested in acquiring a security equipment manufacturer, but we are interested in being able to deliver value in that market, maybe through our metal fabrication and some of our capabilities. Access to market. Access to market is another one. And then, you know, really we talk about it a lot, but our ADAPT group, which is our project management group, just allows us to offer more goods and services to our customer base, which increases our value to that customer. So when we look at something like security, we see it as an extension in the goods and services we offer, but we don't necessarily have to make it as much as we have to own the, the design, the integration, and the, the installation and delivery of it. Now, when you go somewhere else, you know, um, we'll talk about, uh, you know, I'm just going to use this as an example. It's not anything that we actively are engaged with or anything, uh, and it does, it's, that doesn't necessarily reflect anything we're going, but I'll just use it as an example. You know, let's say we were getting into uh, checkout counters or something like that. Um, that would probably be closer to a, a make uh, equation because, you know, in that, in that segment, we do a lot. We already do a lot of the things that are required for making checkout counters. We already have a lot of the technology and the capabilities, and we source similar materials and things like that. So that might be more of a, hey, look at this acquisition can get us a start, uh, but we can add a lot of value because of our already – uh, strong internal capabilities. So th that's kind of how we look at it, uh, make versus buy, and it, and it changes depending on what that M&A target might be. Oh, that's great, color, Jim. Thanks. And it, it, you know, just kind of raised a question in my mind when you talk about, you know, other extensions like checkout counters. You know, I think of security as kind of there's sort of two benefits, right, with um, – you know, getting into that business is, you know, you, you've certainly your background, your experience, but, you know, you're selling a, you know, presumably a little bit of a higher margin product, but then you have the recurring revenue stream, um, which with it, you correct me if I'm wrong, but might be sort of that recurring communication with customers, you know, leading to, you know, other opportunities down the road. But um, is there a recurring revenue component to checkout counters or is that uh, does that sort of fall into the you know, sort of like refrigerant category where, you, you know, you, you'd, you'd be obviously able to do some service and stuff like that, but uh, not really a, a consistent revenue stream? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, you just did a, you, a, a great uh, kind of connection there. I think that checkout counters, belt-driven or, or fixed, 
uh, fall more in kind of the refrigerated and non-refrigerated display type of market, right? There might be some service to it, uh, but there's really not any recurring revenue. However, if you look at the security market, um, you know, and our initial uh, view on that is a, a strong lean towards surveillance. Uh, but when you look at intrusion and hold up and things like that, there is a well-established recurring revenue model associated with that. And uh, it's not, listen, this, there's no way we're going to go from zero to meaningful contribution in the security market, you know, in the next six months or something. But on a longer term basis, recurring revenue is something that we want to we want to continue to put a focus on not only, uh, you know, for the business and the income stream and the convenience of the customer, uh, but from a commercial standpoint, it tends to create uh, stickiness and a kind of a closer uh, proximity to the customer. You're in contact with them more often. You're, you're um, seeing things that are happening within their business, and you're able to act as a good partner and, off, and, and many times offer a solution or, uh, you know, assistance. And so... We are very focused on, you know, expanding our recurring revenue model. Uh, the digital menu boards are a good example of it. It's, you know, it's a good start. Um, and, you know, we continue to look for ways that we can make that happen. But uh, no matter what happens there, it's not going to be something that happens overnight. And it's not going to be, you know, a, a, you know, a triple digit contributor uh, to revenue or income, you know, quickly. It, we're going to have to, it's going to be pick and shovel work, but it, we're in the process of doing it, and we want to make sure that it all fits within our vertical market strategy. Oh, that makes sense. Uh, thanks for uh, the additional color, and uh, uh, thanks for all the great work. Uh, good luck this quarter. Yeah, thank you. There are no further que questions in the queue. I'd like to hand the call back to management for closing comments. Yeah, I, I just want to say thank you again for all of those that take the time to, to get on the call or follow us after. Um, you know, our story has consistently been about execution and, you know, what I always refer to as a high say-do ratio. Um, our plan, our fast-forward plan uh, that extends out to 2028 is published on our website. It's there and available for investors, but it's also there and available for our suppliers, our employees, our partners, and our customers. And I, and I think it's just a, a document that tells you, you know, that shows you the roadmap and, and what we're planning to do. And uh, it, it just remains consistent and connected with our, exec, our philosophy around execution and a high say-do say ratio. So with that, I would just say thank you for the continued following of LSI investment and, and consideration. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, talking to you in the next quarter. Take care. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude today's teleconference. Thank you for your participation. You may disconnect your lines at this time, and have a wonderful day.